Alrighty, welcome to JavaScript Lifestyle Podcast. My name is Kyle Willard. I am your host. Welcome to the show. Episode zero is what we're going to name this one. Intro into JavaScript Lifestyle. We're going to talk about what the podcast is aimed for. We're going to talk about me a little bit. And we're definitely going to dive into a spicy subject. But we're not going to go into the original super spicy take. We're, we're going to try and stick with little little less bites to get things started we'll get some fireworks rolling here in the next few episodes hold tight uh, this will be a weekly podcast it's going to be something that i'm i'm working on there will be guests there will be a number of individuals that pop in and out i'm going to try and get some awesome people on here um but without further ado who am i my name is kyle willard i am a former sales rep sales manager and an administrator for a automotive dealer association in the state of oregon it's a mouthful um i have been working with html css since all the way back in 2003 and i spent about two years working on <laughs> working on a wordpress site as the primary administrator for it i didn't code it i did a lot of the uh a lot of the theming, I helped choose all those fun little plugins that you could shove in that guy. Um, it's been a nightmare. So that's who I am. Um, you know, I, I have a pretty pretty fun outlook on life. I, I definitely, you know, want to make sure that I share that. My outlook is pretty simple, right? Go hard or go home. You know, drive fast, get out of the way, you know. There, there are things that need to be done. They need to be done well. They need to be done fast. And that's that's just kind of the mentality. Just go home and go go hard or go home. You know, don't don't kind of play around. Get it done. You know, as, as far as my personal tech stack of choice, I am a full stack JavaScript developer. I love, love some JavaScript. Uh, React, Redux, Apollo Client, Apollo Server, GraphQL, Express, Node, and Postgres. I do have a pretty big love for Mongoose and MongoDB. And you will definitely hear me preach the preach of TypeScript because it's epic. Um, the vision for this podcast is to bring you some fresh takes on a, a varying number of topics inside of software engineering. We're going to talk about, you know, some, unre some unrelated things to software. We're going to talk about, you know, daily life kind of how to how to regain a little bit how to get back to the normal you after crunching code for 12 hours a day and you know I, I'm I'm an 80s kid man there's going to be some video games involved in this somewhere just have to do it so our topic for today is college versus boot camp versus self-taught I know it's been done before I get it I'm going to bring you a hot take from somebody that's done honestly all three. So in 2006, I actually took a college level HTML class. Later on, a couple of years later, I did a, I was actually a IT security and data assurance major and dove into Java just very, very shortly. Um, I ironically swore up and down that I would never be a code cruncher. I didn't want to start lines of code all day. And here we are. It's a thing. I love it. Um, I understand it's been done. My take is this. There's there's a lot of different variables that you need to consider, and I don't think that there's a good option for everybody. I think that there are a number of good options that are going to fit different people in different ways. And I, I think that we really need to be mindful of the fact that people learn differently. People need different environments. You know, people have different goals, different backgrounds, different, you know, personal situations. And we need to be mindful of that. Um, 
you know, I am I am going to be upfront and honest about my bias. I definitely do appreciate the mindset of boot camps. I appreciate, you know, the the vision by boot camps to kind of take you to a college level without the superfluous stuff that comes with a college education. There are some detriments there. We're going to get into that. But before we get there, let's talk about some keys to consider when you're you're trying to decide what you want to do. You know, what what route do you want to take? You know, you've you've got these three cho- three basic choices, college, boot camp, self-taught. And I I think we need to I think we need to take time and examine them a little bit, right? So what's what's my number one key? My number one key personally is what are employers looking for? Are they looking for a college degree? Are they looking for just experience? Are they looking for just somebody who knows how to do the job? And I think I think this is a bit of an issue in the industry currently because it, it really has ultimately been, you know, for years and years, generally you go to college, you learn computer science, you get your bachelor's degree, and you get hired on with a company. Well, unfortunately, that's not always the case anymore. And we kind of we kind of have to make sure that as an industry, we're open to evolution. You know, software engineering, honestly, should be the most flexible, open, diverse industry on the face of the planet because there's so much changing all the time, every single second of the day. You know, we, we, had, a, we had a massive evolution in the web when Amazon really took, took a footing and took off we had another massive, massive change in the internet when we saw, you know, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and social media really explode into what it is. And we had another, you know, kind of revolution where we went from, you know, these interactive web pages to single page applications and actually fully fleshed out web applications. And I, I think that as we continue, that's going to be a thing. So when it when it comes to hiring i think that we need to to a large degree ditch the old school mindset of oh my god you have to have a college degree to get here and i think we're starting to do that i definitely think we're starting to do that i think it's going to be a slow change i think it's one that needs to be done on a more in a more rapid fashion um but yeah so what do employers look like look at You know, they're going to look for a bunch of different things. They're going to look at your experience. Some are going to look for a degree. But I think ultimately what software engineers need to understand is like we can't just cater to employers as an individual. We need to also, you know, just be the best that we can be at our craft. You know, some of the best carpenters in the world, you know, these these guys that, you know, they started out doing things like framing houses. Some of these guys sit in their garage, work for themselves, and they make masterpieces out of wood. Some of them use scrap wood, like pallets, wooden boxes, and things like that. And I think, I I definitely think that that mindset of, hey, you know, I just want to be the best at what I do. That's where we need to be. We need to, you know, be comfortable showing off what we make, how we made it. And I, I think that, you know, to a degree, maybe we replace some of the old guard and we start our own agency so that we can start adopting that kind of mindset. I, I certainly think that freelancers and people that start their own agencies, man, there's a lot of courage in that because it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. And you basically have to stay at the top of your game at all times. But by the same token, you know, if I owned an agency, I'll tell you, first thing I'm doing is I am building an education application where all of my new hires, all of my interns, you know, all of whoever I can shove through, you know, the door of this education infrastructure I built, every single one of those people has a shot of working for my, working for my company. Why? Because I'm going to train them my way with the stack that I want them to know for the projects that I know that I have coming I'm going to be able to take the top 10% of those people, and those are the ones that are going to get a job. To me, being able to know where somebody's at 100% is honestly more valuable 
than a degree from Harvard or MIT. If I have somebody who's creative, who's diligent, who's driven, who really wants to do the job, then I would rather have that person than some kid who mom and dad paid through the college education, went through college, got out, and all of a sudden they're looking for a job. But I don't own an agency, so let's let's kind of look back at what employers are looking at. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a pretty generally accepted thing. We're going to have a resume. We're going to show our GitHub. We're going to have a LinkedIn. We're probably going to have a Twitter. We're going to have a portfolio. We're going to show off our, our more intense projects, whether, you know, that's the more fleshed out ones. Maybe that's the cool ones. You know, maybe that's the really creative and innovative ones. You know, or maybe that is just, you know, I want to show off the stuff that this specific employer is hiring for because I like that sub industry. You know, if, if I wanted if I wanted to be in, you know, education technology, I would build an LMS. If I wanted to be in, you know, an e-commerce setting, I would build an innovative e-commerce solution and have it on display. But that's not the only thing to consider. The, the, the next real thing when it comes to, you know, what path to choose to learn is what is best for you. Everybody comes from varying backgrounds, from, you know, different walks of life, from different parts of, you know, the world at this point. You know, they come from different beliefs, different ideologies, different religions. They come from everywhere, you know, f- they may be male, they may be female, like it really doesn't matter. We have a vast pool of people that are interested in getting into software engineering and because of their lived experiences, they need to do what's best for them. You know, single mom in the inner city is not going to want to spend four years getting a college degree. She may want to, but it's going to be very, very difficult for her to do that on her own. So as, a, as an industry, we need to say, hey, this, this single mom might be the next innovative master bringing us a masterpiece and we're not going to let her into the industry because she's a single mom. That, that's basically what we're saying when we point at college degrees and say that that's, that's the end of the story. And there's a lot of that. You know, the other piece is, you know, learning style. You know, who, who are you? How do you learn? Are, are you are you the person that you know doesn't need oversight to get stuff done are you are you the the person in the corner who hey here's your assignment and you crank it out in the matter of you know 20 minutes and asks for more or are you the guy that really does you know generally need assistance hey I, I need you to stay on top of me to make sure that I'm getting this done I'm, I'm, I'm down to do it but by the same token you know I, I do drift off into the ether on an on an occasional basis you know these are these are things to consider and you know it it comes down to what's best for you you know some people are able to just look at the documentation for code and i i think that this is the end goal for everybody that everybody should be striving to just being able to look at documentation and learn however there's a large swath of people that need to, you know, jump into what we lovingly refer to as tutorial hell for a while and just do tutorials day in and day out until some of the concepts get drilled into their heads. Other people just want to get their hands dirty. They just want to dive into the muck, break it until it works. And I I would argue that every single one of these routes is viable. Every single one of these routes is going to give you the opportunity to potentially become a great software engineer. You know, the guy guy who just doesn't even look at documentation, he just dives in and just starts cranking out code and Googles when he breaks something. You know, there's something to be said for that. He's slamming his head against the wall until it works. I don't know about you, but determination and drive is, to me, a very important factor when we're talking about employees, when we're talking about coworkers, when we're talking about life in general, you know, having having the ambition, the drive, and the determination to get through something like that is definitely huge. You know, maybe maybe you need a mix. Maybe you need a, a lecture where somebody goes over stuff 
it's not so much a tutorial, but it's, hey, this is, this is the topic. This is what you need to learn. This is why you need to learn it. Here's where to find resources on it. Here's an assignment to do. Go do it. Maybe that is the important part when we're, when we're talking about learning. Maybe that's how you learn. You know, let's, the next key is, you know, what to learn, where, and how to learn it. And this one, this one mainly aims at folks that are, that are self-taught. And after this, we're going to dive into kind of a comparison of, of the different routes. But let's, let's talk about this, right? So it's, it's a hugely varied topic. You know, if, if you're somebody that wants to just make pretty pages, you literally, like, you just want to make it pretty, then you do a look at UI UX. Because at that point, you're going to bring that creativity and that aesthetic need to a page, and you're going to do your best to make sure that it looks as good as you can possibly make it. You know, if, if you're somebody who, you know, you, you really just like JavaScript and you don't want to have to worry about potentially security concerns or, you know, how to make something actually run, then maybe you just want to be a front-end developer, which is classically what JavaScript developers were prior to Node, right? So it's, it's not unheard of. It's less common. It's, it's becoming more and more common to be a full-stack developer these days. But definitely, you know, there are positions available for front-end software engineers, and they're going to pay roughly the same. I, I think that I think the pay is one that I kind of missed on this list. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but no, you know, maybe maybe you're the guy that you like puzzles and you want to solve the puzzle and you want to build the engine that runs the entire application. You're going to be a back end person. You know what what that means is is varied though because there are so many different back end frameworks. There's a bunch of different backend languages that you can learn. You know, just off of the top of my head, we're talking, you know, JavaScript with Node, Ruby on Rails, C Sharp and ASP.NET, Python and Django, Python and Flask, Java Spring. I mean, there's there's a ton of ways to do backend. And that is, and that's where it becomes convoluted. And I think that is where things start to get difficult for the self-taught crowd. Is what is the pathway that I need to follow to learn this stuff? And I, I think it comes down to inexperience and the need to, you know, really reevaluate, you know, what do I want to do? What is what is my end goal? And, you know, that's that's hard for some people. And you got to make sure that, you know, you're you're kind of being critical when you look in the mirror and go, what am I good at? What do I want to do? What can I tolerate doing day in and day out? what kind of, of position in the software engineering industry is going to be fulfilling for me? You know, and I, I think that definitely hits when it comes to learning is, you know, you need to learn the skills, the stack, the technologies that you need to fit into the role that you want to be in. You know, if, if you want to be in DevOps, man, you're you're going to be looking, you're going to be understanding continuous integration and continuous deployment substantially better than the average software developer. Why? Because that is your day in and day out to make sure that that's going to function, among other things, obviously. That's that's a very harsh oversimplification. But, I mean, that's, that's the point, though, right, is that each one of these positions, front end, back end, full stack, DevOps, you know, product management, project management, you know, testing. Honestly, every single one of these things, they share common traits, but they also have vastly different roles. And you have to understand what the differences are and you have to understand what is going to fit you the best. And at that point, I think, you know, combined with that knowledge and combined with the knowledge of how you learn, is going to give you your best pathway. But I, I think it's fair to say, do not write down a path or a stack or anything along the lines and say, I need to learn this, period, full stop. Be flexible. And I think that's the biggest thing, is, is there has to be a lot of flexibility in this industry because it's constantly changing. You know, one of one of the innovators in our field, you know, they brought us React, they brought us a number of other things. 
is Facebook. They are constantly changing their applications. You know, they they originally were using Angular. They created React and have continued to support React because it fit their needs better. Understanding the wants, the needs, the desires of your employer and understanding, you know, kind of the the constraints that you're under with that employer as far as, you know, not overstepping your bounds a bit is definitely something to consider, right? So learn what is going to be best for the position that you want to be in. And the, the question is, where do you learn that? And that's really the key to what we're talking about. Where do I go to learn this? Well, here's the honest answer. Anywhere. Literally anywhere. You can go to a community college and learn computer science. You can go to a state university and learn computer science. You can go to Harvard or MIT and you can learn computer science. You know, there's there's good and bad there, right? But the reality becomes I can get the same information. I mean, especially especially when we're talking about Harvard, CS50, the intro into computer science for Harvard is a free to participate class online. You can go today as a 13-year-old if you're so inspired and go start doing Harvard's CS50 program. If you want, there are a ton of different ways to audit, you know, different MOOCs and other courses all throughout the internet. You've got Udemy, you've got Google, you have YouTube, you have Stack Overflow if you just want to read different solutions. You have the documentation for the different frameworks and libraries and languages. But at the end of the day, it, it goes back to what is best for you. If you need... If you feel that you need and you want a college degree, go to college for two to six years. Go do it. Just understand the expense. You know, last I looked, and, and definitely correct me if I'm wrong, college education, roughly, you're looking at somewhere between twenty and $30,000 a year, it seems like. Like, I want to say a bachelor's degree at my local state university is $60,000 per bachelor's. For a master's, you're adding another thirty to $40,000 to it. By the time you're done with a college, with a computer science degree from college, a decent college, and the proof that you can actually do the job, you're going to end up paying for that within the first, you know, five to ten years. You're going to make the money to support it, hopefully. But I mean, that's that's a whole no, another whole other topic. Is that wages for software engineers can range as low as thirty thousand dollars, and go as high as you know. Some folks making half a million dollars a year or a million dollars a year. I mean, it just all depends on your success. But, you know, reasonably, I think the bottom of the six figure chart around 100, 120 is really where most people are going to be at. So, you know, is, is it worth it to you to get that diploma to put on the wall and pay that, you know, 60 to, 60 to 100 grand for a bachelor's and master's degree? By contrast, the next paid method is to go to a boot camp. I got to tell you, I, I have I have a lot of admiration, love, and respect for boot camps, but there are faults. There is good, there is bad. And, you know, definitely if you read through my Medium articles, I definitely am very open about it. I currently go to Lambda School. And the mindset behind it was that, you know, to be honest, the one of the founders, Austin Allred, really, you know, his, his mindset when it came to education was really inspiring to me. The fact that you could sign a income share agreement or an ISA and not pay until I hit a certain amount of cash. And if I don't hit that certain salary over the course of five years, then it just disappears and I don't have that debt. The, the mindset of aligning you know, the, the student's success with to the success of the school, you know, that's definitely a thing. The problem is, is it's a very hard model to maintain and you get paid very slowly. And if we're being honest, there are people that are going to game the system. They're going to go get the education. They're going to, you know, end up 
doing a job that fits into the requirements for the ISA and they're just never going to pay the ISA. Right. So, I mean, it's boot camps are cool, but the problem is, is that, you know, from my personal experience with Lambda school, there's not a huge amount of support. If you need it, there really is a, a huge gap when it comes to expanding outside of the assigned, you know, technology stack that the boot camp offers. You know, there, there's not a lot there. There's no assistance on it. If you're doing, you know, portfolio projects, you're doing stuff outside of the scope of the school, there's there's nothing there. And there's no real attempt to build that community. And it could be different at different boot camps. I'm going to be very clear on that. I have only gone to Lambda School. I only intend to go to Lambda School. But at the end of the day, you need to understand it is on you. You know, Austin Allred, shortly after I started Lambda School, made a very, very clear, concise statement that's really stuck with me. Lambda School teaches you to learn. It teaches you how to teach yourself. It is on you to learn. And when it comes to software engineering, I honestly think that's the case for basically all of us. I think that talking about a self-taught software engineer, I, I think it's a misnomer. I think it's I think it's kind of hypocritical that we're, you know, undervaluing some of these self-taught engineers. Because at the end of the day, if I go through a computer science bachelor's and I get all the way through it, well, guess what? I know algorithms. I know data structures. I know memory management. I understand the concepts. But guess what? There's a good chance that I learned C. I might have learned Python or C+. But there's a good chance that the languages that are going to actually be the most employable, stuff like JavaScript isn't taught in these programs. Now, I can't speak to every program, right? I mean, there are a ton of different schools. There are a ton of different options. Some are better than others. Some are worse than others. Some are just flat out useless. But at the end of the day, a computer science degree seems to me to be based in algorithms, data structures, memory management, you know, understanding how the web was made, you know, understand the more theoretical and classical concepts. While they're still important, you need to understand those. And I and that was part of the reason I went to Lambda School is because they offer a computer science portion. I think it's important to understand those. But, I mean, we also have websites like Algo Expert that has a course that's going to go over the most common ones that you need to know for interviews, which are usually the most common ones that you're going to use, you would imagine, right? Wouldn't you interview using the algorithms and data structures that you're actually going to be using in your stack? Makes sense to me. But I mean, for 200 bucks, I can go learn a good portion of the algorithms and data structures, or I can use YouTube, etc., and get that knowledge. But at the end of the day, if, if it's focused on the computer science side of things and it's not focused on the actual programming language, the popular libraries, the interactions between the language and the library, you know, you have to turn around after the fact with a computer science degree and you have to learn more on your own. I, I, I know college graduates who were in computer science and they got out with a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree or a master's degree and they go to a boot camp to learn the languages to make sure that they can understand the stacks to actually get employed because they don't know the languages, they just know the theoretical side of things. Or they know the algorithms, they know the, the data structures, the memory management, they know C+. Which is great if you want to build a desktop application, but I mean, there, there's, not, there's not a lot, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of C++ web servers running around. Basically where you see that is Node. So... Let's let's be real here. You know what what's the best route? You know you're you're gonna you're gonna spend sixty ninety grand to go to college, or if you go to a boot camp, you've got a couple boot camps like um, New Camp I think is one of them that's like seventeen nineteen hundred bucks something like that, all the way up to Lambda School which is maximum of thirty thousand dollars depending on your income. So. If, if let's let's just put it at the max with Lambda School, since that's where I've got my experience, if I'm going to pay $30,000 for 
I would imagine that my education is going to be college par. I am going to imagine that by the time I am done with Lambda School, I understand the critical components, how to use them, how to implement them, how to learn more, and I'm going to have, you know, the support backing to make sure that I'm able to get through the program. You know, and that's and that's the myth, right? If I'm to summarize Lambda School's current state, support is a big issue. Now, is it fair to say that? I think so. Is it something that I know for a fact they're working on? Sure. Sure. A hundred percent. I, without any question in my mind, think that Lambda School is trying very, very hard to rectify the lack of support issue and the lack of community issues inside of their boot camp as quickly as they possibly can. Why? Because they're private. They need to make money. The only way to keep a product running is to ensure that you're continuing to get paid. If you're not making enough to keep the lights on, then it's not worth doing. Now, let's uh, let's kind of move forward. Let's talk about self-taught. Self-taught is a really different experience. Because on one end, when you're first starting out, it, it you don't really know what to look for. And so you end up with, you know, some information, but not a huge amount that's really concise. And then all of a sudden, as you, as you dip your toes into the ocean of software engineering and learning software engineering... All of a sudden, the floodgates open up, and now you have mountains and mountains and mountains worth of information because it, software engineering is so vast an industry. You know, and and that's and that's the biggest issue I ran into prior to coming to Lambda School is that you know what the hell am I going to learn? What am I supposed to be learning right now? You know, for me, I was looking at Java and Python. You know, I, I was starting to dabble with both of them. It was one of those where it was like, all right, these are going to be my programming languages. Java, I can make desktop applications. Python, I can do the same thing. Python can be used as a server. Java can be used as a server. Like, I'm going to go this route. And then I found JavaScript. And I got to tell you, there's, there's a lot of crazy things you can do with JavaScript. I swear to God, every time I see the three letters of VAR, on Stack Overflow, I want to flip my computer monitor because VAR is evil. I learned that very rapidly. VAR is the devil. But, you know, and, that, and that's the thing, is that if you have a path, if you can find the information to build your stack, and your stack meets with the constraints of the industry, and you learn it well, and you can present that work, I think you're good, right? Well, I don't know. And this, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a step away from the edu- education side of it, and I want to talk about the hiring industry f- for software engineering for a minute. You have HR managers and, you know, senior developers that will post these job ads, and they say, hey, we want a junior-level developer with five years of experience in three different programming language. And by God, you need to know 10 different libraries and you need to know continuous integration, continuous deployment. You need to know Git. You need to understand the software life cycle. I mean, by the time you're done reading the job ad, you basically just read a dissertation on software engineering. And at the bottom of it, they're offering thirty to $50,000 for a junior developer with what amounts to 10 years of experience. That's an issue. As people that are learning to get into the software engineering world, I think it is incumbent on us, instead of just looking at these job ads, we, we ignore the experience part of it. Stop looking at the fact that they want a thousand years of experience and they want you to know literally everything that you can possibly know about software engineering to get a junior level engineering job stop it stop just dear god stop instead put the time and the energy that you would have wasted howling at the moon because this thirty thousand dollar gig wanted you know everything including the kitchen sink thrown at it 
Instead of that, put the energy into projects. Build your portfolio to the point where there is no question that you are a software engineer, you're a good software engineer, you have the skill set to be the best. Be the best that you can be and show it off. When it comes to your portfolio, when it comes to your projects, that is not a time to be humble. You, you don't need to be humble when you're showing off what you can do. That That's the point in time where you look at your buddy at the party, you hand him a beer and say, hold my beer. Check this out. Boom! That's right. I made that. You know, one of, one of my struggles, and I'll be honest about this, one of my struggles doing projects is that the projects that I want to do and the projects that I'm working on are stupid complex. I'm having to reinvent the wheel and I'm doing it intentionally. You know, one of, one of the projects that I personally have going on, and I'll kind of explain the complexity to you, one of the projects that I'm working on very slowly is building a learning management system out of Node with Postgres. Why is it complex? Because I want to go to the nth degree when it comes to user experience and user interface. I want the course developer to have a cute little dashboard to make their own courses, track metrics, sell it, etc. And I want it to be so stupid simple that literally a six-year-old could use it. And let me tell you, I'll be using my six-year-old to make sure that that's possible. I'm not even kidding. But I want my six-year-old to be able to look at that dashboard and intuitively be able to build things without reading documentation. I want to lower the training curve for an LMS so low to the point that a middle school kid can decide, hey, I want to make a course on how to build Legos. Cool. You do you. Why? Because I think that there's a need for people to teach others. And I want to make sure that as I build this project, it is the most accessible project from, you know, screen readers, from color theory for those that have color blindness, you know, the audio side of things. I'm going to have, you know, some sort of transcripting system built into it, but it's going to be stupid complex to the point that I've actually had to talk about microsystems. I've had to talk about, do I need 12 different servers to make this work? I had a six hour conversation about that not too long ago. But the point is, do not go soft. Don't don't just put together a cute little e-commerce site and call it a day. Build the next target website. Build in your web scanning. You know, being able to scan a QR code or a barcode. You know, build in a pickup or drop off methodology into it. Build in a dynamics taxation system. Build in OAuth. Why not? Build in every single feature that you, the developer, want to see in these kind of systems. Because I, th I think, honestly, I think if we're being honest and we're being reasonable and we're being adults about it, software engineering companies care substantially more about what you can do than the piece of paper hanging on the wall. But I think that because of our, our culture, and I, I think that this is, you know, at this point, a world cultural norm, everybody wants to see the diploma. Everybody wants to see that you've been able to complete college. There, there's, a, there's a quiet understanding that realistically, you might know, you might not know half of the stuff that the self-taught guy does. But guess what? It's the piece of paper to put on the wall. Now, I am not bashing the value of college education. I want to make that very clear. You know, my personal experiences aside, college education is critical. And I think that, you know, as kind of a, a wrap up for today's podcast, I, I think I think it's important to remember that college education is critical. 
I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to a doctor's office where the doctor didn't go to medical school. That's kind of important. That said, do you honestly think that I care that your receptionist has a bachelor's degree? Is that receptionist better than the you know, high school graduate with a couple years of experience that it, that's been doing this in mom and pop's office that just wanted to get out of mom and pop's shadow and they wanted to get out and get a, get a job and, you know, with other people who who's better, the person who just came out of college or the person that's been doing it for two to three years, but they don't have college. And that's the problem is that there are very specific industries that I think that it is a critical, critical component that they go to college. Engineers, architects, lawyers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, and, and, and obviously there's vastly more. But I think at the end of the day, I don't think that it's critical for a number of jobs, software engineering being one of them. And I think that we as a society and as an industry need to evolve away from staring at that piece of paper and saying that that's the most important component. I think we're doing it. I think it's in I think it's in process. And I'm not bashing companies that do it, right? That's their standard. They want to have a specific specific standard of hiring. More power to you do you. But I'm going to be honest. As as a uh, software engineer that's looking for a job who knows other software engineers that are looking for jobs, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You, you ready? You, can, can you hear me? You're going to miss the next great thing. You're going to. And the reason why I say that is because at the end of the day, not being inside of the constraints of a college or a university or even a boot camp gives you freedom. Self-taught engineers, there is a damn good chance that a self-taught engineer is going to be the next person to make a world-changing application. Hell, it might have already been built and we just don't know about it because they haven't launched it. Because they don't have the backing and they can't afford to drop it on AWS and show it off. Maybe it's so complex that it would cost hundreds of dollars a month to get there. Guys, don't discount the little guys. Don't discount the folks that don't have a college degree just because of the piece of paper. And for those looking to learn, like there are so many routes to go. Find the one that is best for you. Find the one that is going to fit your needs, your wants, and your timeline. If you're 18 years old and you're trying to decide whether to become a software engineer or go to college, take the summer. Hit the pause button on life. Stop partying. Stop playing. Stop playing with video games. Take the next three months. Focus on a specific programming language and learn everything that you can possibly learn about that programming language. Were you able to do it at home without going to college? Cool. Was it a massive struggle? Was it was it one of those situations where you were ready to pull out your hair after 20 minutes every single time? You got on the internet and started looking at the materials. Did you simply just not understand it? Okay. You, you might want to consider at the very least looking at something like you, Demi. If not taking the time, the energy and the money and going either to a boot camp or college. But at the end of the day, the biggest thing that I want to suggest, the biggest thing that I want to encourage and preach and scream at the top of my lungs is go hard. Take the time, put in the work, build the most badass project that you possibly can, and don't apologize for it. It is not time to be humble when you're showing off what you can do. Don't don't give me something this simple. You, you want to clone Twitter? Clone Twitter. But when you're done cloning Twitter, add the features that you want in Twitter to Twitter. You want to clone Facebook? Dear God, make it your own. Make it you. Show off who you are and what you can do 
and what your personality is in the lines of code that you're shoving onto GitHub. All right. I, I definitely can rant on that for another two hours. I'm not going to. I promise. I hope. I hope that this information, that what you learned, that our first day zero podcast, episode zero, introduction into JavaScript lifestyles, I hope you enjoyed. And I hope that next week when we drop our, another, our next one, you will be back to listen to it. Come back. Let's do it again. Let's get more in depth. Let's get to the point where I start seeing, you know, comments and questions and concerns and topics that you want to explore. With over the course of the next week, I will be dropping social media links. I will be creating, you know, everything that I need to ensure that I'm getting information from you guys. And I want to hear it. I want to see it. I want to grow this podcast to be the place that people feel comfortable saying, hey, this is a problem in our industry. Or, hey, this is something to celebrate in our industry. And I think it's fair to say, just like every single industry on the face of this pretty planet, there are issues and there are things to celebrate. And there are big innovations and news. And we're going to talk about all of it. Hell, I contemplated, if I had time, sitting here and having a 20-minute conversation about the fact that the Call of Duty League has had server issues in live broadcasts for the last six weeks, and I want to know why. I'm tired of sitting there staring at reruns while you guys are fixing your servers in the middle of everything. Come on, guys. I want to, I want to watch some COD. Let's go. All right. As, as a close to every one of these podcasts, I'm going to be sharing awesome libraries that I either use or have looked at pretty intensely just so that you can explore, just so that you can play with new stuff. This week's, to be honest, I'm going to be straight up. There's a lot more. I've, I've got four of them, and three of them are going to be back in for the most part. Number one is Chalk.js. So Chalk makes your console logs pretty. That literally is the only function of this library. Is It's going to colorize your console logs, give you the ability to use bold, have a colored background, all sorts of cool things. Check out chalk, npmjs.com backslash chalk. Uh, the next one is going to be Swagger. Swagger is cool. It is a premium service, but there is a free side to it. It's kind of a pain to get set up initially, but once you figure it out, it's pretty awesome. Um, Swagger, what it does is it helps you with API documentation, makes it clean and concise, and definitely shows it off. If you are an API developer, if you are building on the back end and you need to make sure that you have crystal clear, pretty precise, yeah, they really should sponsor the show. Just going to put it out there. Get Swagger. Swagger.io. Swagger.io. All right. So everybody knows about Bcrypt. Bcrypt is awesome. It is what 90% of us use to hash passwords, right? Well, guess what? Bcrypt got beaten out, folks. And the library is called Argon2. Argon2 is awesome. It's just as easy to use as Bcrypt. Definitely check it out if you want to make sure that your stuff is as secure as it possibly can be, which is important. Let's be real. This is like something that everybody should like jump up and down and make sure that they look at. And then last but not least, occasionally you want to make sure that you're, you have tooltips on your website or in your application. You want to make sure that your user scrolls over something and all of a sudden, whoa, wait a minute, there's a tooltip and it says something. What's it say? Popper.js takes a lot of the hassle out of it. Um, again, npmjs.com backslash popper.js. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you know, allegedly we got some aliens from other planets hanging around because they're flying around to UFOs. I guess that's a thing. So if you're out there, Everybody, thank you for coming to the show. Thank you for taking the time to listen in. Have a good week. Study hard. Learn more. And at the end of the day, when you're making projects, go all out. All right, folks. I'm out of here. You have a great weekend.